Hello and welcome to Science in Crisis. Although much of the accumulated scientific evidence is consistent with many current scientific theories, some data are not. Today this video explores three areas in which traditional science has problems explaining all the data such that scientists are either at a loss for an acceptable explanation or have resorted to unreasonable alternative explanations for the anomalous data. Typically, anomalous data are not publicized. The data I explore here point to a grand creator. However, to acknowledge God as the author of the cosmos and that he has placed some majestic importance to this particular planet is perhaps the ultimate crisis in contemporary science. My name is Brad Tuttle. I hold a PhD from Arizona State University. And let's get started. For millennia, people thought that the Earth was the center of everything and that the sun, the planets, and the stars revolved around the Earth. But in the mid-16th century, Copernicus viewed the Earth as only one participant within a sun-centered solar system, which itself is eventually seen as only a peripheral participant in a tremendously larger universe. A natural conclusion arising out of the Copernicus model is that the Earth is no more important than any other celestial object, and that as observers we do not occupy a special place in the cosmos. This perspective is termed the Copernicus Principle. The Copernicus principle says that the Earth is just a speck within a group of other specks, the circle a small star which is, is itself a speck, when seen against the almost infinite cosmos, the cosmos which denotes random order arising out of infinite chaos. Today the idea is wholly accepted by scientists, and the Copernicus principle is an assumed concept in many astronomical theories. One recent problem for the Copernicus Principle and the idea that the Earth is wholly insignificant when viewed against the entirety of the universe is Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB. According to NASA, Cosmic Microwave Background is the afterglow, radiation left over from the hot Big Bang or the birth of the universe. Its temperature is extremely uniform over all the sky. However, tiny temperature variations or fluctuations at the part per million level are thought to provide great insight into the origin, evolution, and content of the universe. Here we see a larger map of the CMB from the entire known cosmos in the same way that the smaller map shows the entire world sphere in a single flat picture. Blue is colder and red is hotter. In order to obtain accurate data about cosmic microwave background radiation, humans launched a number of satellites specifically equipped to measure it. The first was the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, and the second was launched named the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe satellite. Here we see two maps of CMB from each satellite. <clears throat> the orientation of the maps are such that the plane of the Milky Way runs horizontally across the center of each image. The actual average temperature of the of Cosmic Microwave Background is 2.725 Kelvin. The images are displayed in a scale such that the blue corresponds to 2.721 Kelvin and red is 2.729 Kelvin. The yin-yang picture in the top two maps is the dipole anastropy, which results from the motion of the sun relative to the rest frame of the cosmic microwave background. Moving towards the CMB appears hotter than moving away. The bottom map pair shows the microwave sky after the dipole anisotropy has been subtracted from the map. The, this removal eliminates most of the fluctuations in the map. On these maps, the hot regions shown in red are 0 0.0002 Kelvin hotter than the cold region shown in blue. The Big Bang Theory implies that CMB should be uniform throughout the cosmos regardless of which direction you look. This is called isotropy and is an important implication of the theory on how the cosmos was born. Scientists tested this implication by dividing the cosmos into halves and then investigating whether the temperature differ differs between the halves. The trick is to find the best place to put the dividing line. Isotropy and the Big Bang Theory, however, say that there is no best place because no line should result in significant differences between halves. In this picture, the horizontal line represents the plane associated with the Milky Way. One can test the average temperature of CMB above and below the imaginary plane defined by the Milky Way. But why parallel to the Milky Way? Why not perpendicular? Or at a 45 degree angle? Or how about rotating the plane around and around? 
And what is so special about the Milky Way? Why not pick some other point in space? The possibilities are endless. We need to take a short detour before learning what the scientists actually did in order to describe one, the ecliptic plane or the plane created by the path that the Earth follows as it goes around the Sun, and two, the plane called the celestial equator that is separate from the ecliptic plane because the Earth is tilted 23.44 degrees on its axis in relationship to the ecliptic. No other planet is similarly tilted. Therefore, no other planet describes the celestial equator, and the celestial equator cannot be derived by solely viewing the solar system. It takes the Earth and its special tilt. In all the cosmos, the celestial equator is peculiar and unique to the Earth. It turns out that one plane orientation actually does produce a significant difference in the average temperature of each hemisphere of the cosmos. This is the purple plane pointed to by the red arrow in the current slide and is perpendicular to the ecliptic plane of the solar system. Imagine the purple plane extending in all directions to the ends of the universe to cut it in half. Furthermore, the plane passes through the highest and lowest points on the celestial equator, that is the summer and winter solstice points on Earth's orbit, where the north pole is closest to the sun and furthest away from the sun. Astonishingly, the difference between the hot hemisphere and the cold hemisphere is much larger than would be expected if the warm and cool spots of the CMB sky were randomly distributed. The cosmos is anisotropic. It is not isotropic as the Big Bang theory predicts. The data mean that the entire cosmos reflects the path that the Earth travels around the Sun and the tilt of the planet Earth in relation to that path and no other planet or solar system or anything else in all the cosmos accounts for this structure. And because the CMB was created at the initial Big Bang, it means that the entire cosmos was designed from its birth around the Earth's orbit and tilt. Is the Earth really that important? Perhaps the Earth is more than just a speck among specks in an unbelievably gargantuan cosmos. CMB data have some scientists questioning whether the Copernicus principle is dead. Scientists very, very much would like to explain the CMB anomaly. They present three possibilities. The first possibility is that there has been an error in the analysis of the data. Most scientists greatly discount this possibility owing to the fact that some very, very smart people have been working on this problem now for about 30 years using some very, very sophisticated computers and techniques. It would take a fairly significant collective scientific mind lapse to account for the rather clear and repeatedly replicated results. Anyone is free to copy the data and perform their own analysis if they believe they know what all these smart people did wrong. Second, many scientists suggest that the satellites themselves created some type of measurement error. Accordingly, they commissioned a new satellite with instruments to measure CMB so precisely that it is theoretically impossible to measure it any better. More about this on the next slide. Third, some leading scientists suggest that we need a new theory, something other than the Big Bang. So far, scientists have not found a replacement theory. Please note that the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite and the Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe satellite flew inside the Moon's orbit around the Earth. In order to put the rest, the faulty satellite explanation for the anomalous results, scientists launched a new satellite designed to obtain the most accurate CMB data possible. They named it the Planet Satellite, and it circles the Earth at 1.5 million kilometers beyond both the Earth's orbit and outside the Moon's orbit and it contains the most sensitive equipment possible. After it launched, everyone anxiously waited the multiple years it took to accumulate the planning data, hoping to confirm the earlier results and thus validate their notions of the Big Bang. However, it didn't happen that way. Once the data were in, the CMB and isotropy held, and having eliminated human and satellite air, science is now seriously in the market for a new theory. To acknowledge God as the author of the cosmos and that he has placed some grand importance to this particular planet is perhaps the ultimate crisis in contemporary science. As such, scientists find it unthinkable that the Earth could be as important to the universe as the CMB data suggest. But let's think about what religion might say regarding the importance of this particular planet upon which we live. One, the Earth was created first and then the cosmos later. Two, God has designated the earth as his footstool. The term footstool may be more than metaphorical. 
three the bible repeatedly refers to the earth as belonging to christ after all it is the planet where he was born where he lived as a mortal being earth is where he worked out the great and eternal atonement it is where he promised to return and reign four this earth was created to be inhabited by many of the noble and great premortal spirits as recorded in the third chapter of abraham now the lord has shown unto me abraham the intelligences that were organized before the world was and among all these were many of the noble and great ones and god saw these souls that they were good and he stood in the midst of them and he said unto those who were with him we will go down and we will make the earth upon wherein these the noble and great may dwell let's continue our discussion with the science of the cosmos by looking at the question of how old is the universe Current estimates are that the universe is 13.8 billion years old, or about 9 billion years older than the sun and earth. 13.8 billion years is a very long time, and that is good because a very long time is needed for intelligent life, such as humans, to develop from a random group of chemicals as suggested by the theory of evolution. There are, of course, lots of data consistent with an old earth notion, but there are also data that are inconsistent. School textbooks conveniently omit the inconsistent anomalous data. One particularly salient and widely acknowledged anomaly with respect to comets suggests that the Earth may not be nearly as old as scientists currently believe. All comets that pass by the Earth orbit the Sun. Each time a comet comes close to the Sun, the Sun's heat evaporates part of the comet's ice and this dislodges dust to form a tail. Because comets have little mass, each pass around the Sun greatly reduces the comet's size so that eventually, after a few 10,000 years, all the comets should be gone. So assuming the cosmos is billions of years old, there should be no comets left in the solar system. Unless, of course, there's a source for new comets, but where is this? Astronomers originally answered this problem by claiming that the new comets must come from the Kuiper Belt beyond the orbit of Neptune. The theory is no longer held by scientists because evidence suggests that the Kuiper Belt cannot produce comets consistent with known objects that orbit the Sun. Given their rejection of the Cooper Belt hypothesis, scientists proposed a much larger and much more distant theoretical birthplace for the comets we see. This birthplace encompasses the entire solar system like a giant shell. Perhaps you've heard of it by, in the news by its name, the Earth Cloud. Unfortunately, news reporters don't know the difference between theoretical and observable, and they report the Earth Cloud as if it were a fact. Conversely, the Earth cloud is theoretically so far away that we have no way of ever detecting its existence. Indeed, there is no physical evidence for the hypothetical Earth cloud. It is entirely the imagination of scientists. It is a convenient way of maintaining the hypothesis that the Earth and solar system are billions of years old. Scientists reason that, because we observe that all comets have relatively short lives, there must be a source for new comets somewhere, followed by the existence of comets is proof that there is an earth cloud, but saying something twice is not proof, it is a tautology. Without resorting to tautological reason, reasoning, it is possible that comets may not be as old as generally held in science. But then comes the crisis. If the earth isn't really, really old, then what becomes of the theory of evolution? Many people of faith have felt on the defense when confronted by science, often resorting to reinterpreting scripture rather than reimagining science to bridge the gap. An extreme example of reinterpreting scripture to conform with science is a somewhat common belief that God works through the laws of nature. This he supposedly did when creating the earth, such that the account in Genesis of the creation is only poetic and not at all literal. In this thinking, the actual creation took billions of years, like scientists say it did, over which time life gradually evolved from one species to the next until we eventually got to Adam and Eve. This compromised notion and other variations on it restrict the actions of an omniscient God to man's present limited understanding of science and completely negates the role of faith. In contrast, perhaps it is science that should be on the defense. There are plenty of data that do not conform to man's theories regarding the age of the earth and how life is so-called evolved. These anomalies do not make it into the classroom or even into college textbooks, because, as any teacher will tell you, students do not handle inconsistencies very well. Rather, students want concepts taught in black and white lest they become confused. For instance, most people firmly believe that 2 plus 3 equals 5. Well, yes, if you stick with the Greek mathematician Euclid, but Mahalanobis will tell you that 2 plus 3 may equal 5, but probably doesn't. It depends. 
Most people find Malhonobis confusing. While evidence that is inconsistent with science may not prove the scriptural account of this Earth's creation and the advent of man, scientific evidence isn't exactly 100% supportive of the evolutionary model either. Contradictory evidence is typically brushed aside and ridiculed by scientists. Just a few out of the many contradictions to the age of the Earth and the theory of evolution that I find compelling are reviewed here. To reiterate, the following is only a sample of what is out there. It is not meant to prove anything other than science isn't as black and white as many believe. According to modern science, all living things, including man, evolved from basic chemicals to simple organisms to complex organisms over hundreds of millions, if not billions, of years. The present form of the Earth, including its continents, rock strata, and gas, coal, and oil deposits, etc., also evolved over hundreds of millions, if not billions, of years as required by the theory of evolution. Dinosaurs lived between 230 and 65 million years ago, undergoing multiple mass extinctions. The earliest member of the genus Homo is Homo habilis, which evolved around 2.8 million years ago. Homo habilis is the first species for which we have positive evidence of the use of stone tools. Dinosaurs have been extinct for over 60 million years by the time man showed up. Both scientists and individuals of faith believe that the continents were once a single land mass. They differ, however, about when this condition existed and how long it took to separate the continents. So let's first take up the question, how many years did it take for the continents to drift apart into their present state? The answer from scriptures is that the earth was divided within the lifetime of a single individual, Peleg, five generations from Noah. The answer from science is that Pangaea existed about 240 million years ago. Taking the distance from New York City to London, which is 3,459 miles, and dividing this by 240 million years results in 0.91 inches per year. That rate of theoretical historical drift precisely matches the present rate of continental drift and highlights a major assumption of modern science, that the scientific laws and relationships that we currently observe do not change and have not changed and have always existed and will continue to exist as they do today. That is a really big assumption. For example, how long would it take for the Lord to put the continents back together if he so commanded? Would it take 240 million years? This scenario is not so, so far-fetched, where in the scriptures we read, He shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north countries, and the islands shall become one land, and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place, and the earth shall be as it was in the days before it was divided. Scientists have long noted that the continents are eroding much more quickly than originally thought. For example, and based on a number of measures, North America is being denuded or eroded away at a rate that should level it in a mere 10 million years. Or to put it another way, at the current rate, 10 North Americas could have been eroded since the Middle Cretaceous period 100 million years ago. This 10 million year estimate is comparable to the 14 million years that would be needed for all the continents to be plane down to sea level. Skeptics have criticized this argument, saying it naively assumes erosion rates have been perfectly constant over time, which, given the, the just referred to primary assumption in science about constant scientific relationships, seems disingenuous. They also claim it fails to take into account factors such as mountain building and lava flows that can replace some of the eroded materials. Geologists, however, have performed sophisticated calculations that take into account these factors, as well as climate, slope of the terrain, etc. These calculations still yield erosion rates fast enough to plane down the continents in just 10 of millions of years. An alternative explanation for these data is that the Earth may be much younger than science purports. One scientific procedure that is used to justify an old Earth hypothesis, and which tends to perplex individuals of faith, is the dating of fossils and particularly radiocarbon dating. Many people, however, are not aware that the half-life of carbon-14 is only 5,730 years. As such, carbon-14 is useful for dating fossils from about 500 to 50,000 years old, but almost all fossils are claimed to be much older. Hence, scientists don't even bother to carbon-14 date fossils and instead use other methods. When carbon-14 is used to date fossils, however, anomalies have resulted. 
For example, geologists find trace amounts of radiocarbon-14 in coal deposits that seem to indicate an age of around 40,000 years. How can that be when conventional thought holds that coal deposits were largely, if not entirely, formed during the Car Carboniferous period approximately 300 million years ago? The presence of carbon-14 in coal, therefore, is an anomaly that requires explanation. Here's one science explanation. The carbon-14 in coal is newly produced by radioactive decay of the uranium therium isotope series that is naturally found in rocks. The second fungi bacteria hypothesis asserts that carbon-14 in coal is produced by modern microorganisms currently living in the coal. This would probably only inflate carbon-14 values if coal sits in a warm, damp condition exposed to ambient air, whereas most coal is beneath the Earth's surface. Research to confirm or disconfirm these hypotheses is ongoing at this very moment, and so the question of how coal appears uh, so young is ongoing. Just one of the many examples of when carbon-14 data was employed on a fossil yielding anomalous results includes a sea creature called an ammonite, discovered near Redding, California, and accompanied by fossilized wood. Both fossils are claimed by strata da dating to be well, between 112 and 120 million years old, but yielded radiocarbon ages of only thousands of years. Radiocarbon dating isn't as black and white as textbooks make it appear. One alternative to radiocarbon dating is to use strata dating. Theoretically, the Earth's top layers were formed over millions of years in layers called strata. As it turns out, polystrate fossils, or fossils that pass through multiple layers, are a real problem for this theory. For example, Trees in this slide are presumed to have stood for millions of years waiting to be fully covered by various layers of strata. Polystrate fossils are found all over the world. The image on the slide is from Yellowstone National Park. In many areas, layers of rock thousands of feet thick have been lifted, bent, folded without fracturing. How can this happen if they were laid down over hundreds of millions of years and already hardened prior to dramatically shifting? Consider the region around the Grand Canyon showing how most of the Earth's fossil-bearing layers were laid down quickly, then folded while still wet. Exposed in the canyon walls are about 4,500 feet of fossil-bearing layers, conventionally labeled Cambrian to Permian. They were supposedly deposited over a period lasting from 520 to 250 million years ago. And amazingly, this whole sequence of layers rose over a mile around 60 million years ago. The plateau through which Grand Canyon runs is now 7,000 to 8,000 feet above sea level. How are they bent rather than broken? Critics of the theory of evolution ask, why fins one day and fully formed legs the next? Or, dinosaurs that develop overnight super long necks with the necessary modifications to their lung system and with opposing long tails to balance the neck? And why do the replaced species always go extinct? Scientists say that they have lots of transitional fossils, such as the one depicted above. Nevertheless, science is on the defense here. Perhaps the most challenging fossil phenomena for many scientists to explain are the vast graveyards of animal remains as opposed to individual fossils sprinkled evenly throughout the world. Ongoing excavations in the Gobi Desert tell of one such site that has become an embarrassment to evolutionists. 25 theropod dinosaurs have been discovered along with 200 skulls of mammals. There is no evidence of the several million year evolutionary gap or of the iridium boundary that is thought to delineate when the dinosaurs became extinct. In the United States, one finds a plethora of skeletons in New Mexico, in the famous bone cabin quarry of Wyoming, and in Agate Springs, Nebraska, where there is a fossil graveyard of around 9,000 animals. The remains of hundreds of rhinos, three-toed horses, camels, giant wild boars, birds, plants, trees, seashells, and fish are all mixed and intermingled in great confusion. In Alberta, Canada, there is a huge graveyard that stretches for hundreds of miles. In Tanzania, Belgium, and Mongolia, similar massive catastrophes captured vast populations and trapped them in a fossil graveyard of sediment and debris. Some have pointed out that the fossil record is more consistent with global catastrophic events than with gradual accumulation of sediment over millions of years. Specifically, the Great Flood lasted one and a half years before the water subsided enough 
for Noah to leave the ark. It is reasonable to assume that the great deluge was accompanied by tsunamis extending deep inside the continents and possibly repeated volcanic activity along with the rising and sinking of the earth, etc. That is, it did not just rain producing a gentle and gradual rising of the ocean, but lots of water and mud swept the earth in very violent ways. In short, mass fossil graveyards where various animal and plant remains are piled in heaps together are less consistent with the widely held evolutionary model and more consistent with a series of catastrophes operating on the scale of the Genesis Flood. One of my favorite and most fascinating fossil graveyards of all was located in South Carolina near where I live. The Ashley Beds near Charleston was an enormous phosphate graveyard about 18 inches thick that contained mixed remains of man with land and sea animals, notably dinosaurs, plesauruses, whales, sharks, rhinos, horses, mastodons, mammoths, porpoises, elephants, deer, pigs, dogs, and sheep. In fact, Hadrosaurus is pictured on the front of the 1870 book titled The Phosphate Rocks of South Carolina and captioned Skeleton of a Fossil Lizard 18 Feet in Length. This book is in the public domain on the internet. On page 31, the author wrote, It was in this post-Pleocene age, the period when the American elephant or mammoth, the mastodon, rhino rhinosaurus, megatherium, hadrosaurus, and other gigantic quadrupeds roamed the Carolina forest and repaired periodically to these salt lakes. The mixing of these remains was pell-mell throughout the roughly 40 square mile area of this deposit. By one estimate, bones made up about 65% of the extraordinary phosphate deposits in the region of the Ashley River Basin before it was largely mined out. Evolutionists have tried to propose a credible mechanism for mixing creatures from the Cretaceous to Holocene in this one stratum, but no, none have been satisfactory, and the matter has simply been expunged from current references to this site. If dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago, why do some dinosaur fossils still contain well-preserved soft tissues? A recent discovery by Dr. Mary Schweitzer, however, has given reason for all but committed evolutionists to question this assumption. Dr. Schweitzer studied bone slices from the fossilized thigh bones of the Tyrannosaurus rex found in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana under the microscope. To her amazement, the bones showed what appeared to be blood vessels of the type seen in bone and marrow, and these contained what appeared to be red blood cells with nucle nuclei typical of reptiles and birds, but not mammals. The vessels even appeared to be lined with specialized endothelial cells found in all blood vessels. Amazingly, the bone marrow contained what appeared to be flexible tissue. Initially, some skeptical scientists suggested that bacteria biofilms, dead bacteria aggregated in a slime, formed what only appeared to be blood vessels and bone cells. Recently, Schweitzer and co-workers found biochemical evidence for intact fragments of the protein collagen, which is the building block of connective tissue. This is important because collagen is a highly distinctive protein not made by bacteria. Some re evolutionists have strongly criticized Schweitzer's conclusions because they are understandably reluctant to concede the existence of blood vessels, cells with nuclei, tissue elasticity, and intact protein fragments in a dinosaur bone dating at 68 million years old. Other evolutionists who find Schweitzer's evidence too compelling to ignore simply conclude that there is some previously unrecognized form of fossilization that preserves cells and protein fragments over tens of millions of years. Needless to say, no evolutionist has publicly considered the possibility that dinosaur fossils may not actually be millions of years old. In 2017, the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology in Alberta, Canada unveiled a dinosaur so well preserved that many have taken to call it, calling it an honest-to-goodness dinosaur mummy. With the creature's skin, armor, and even some of its guts intact, researchers are astounded at its nearly unprecedented level of preservation after nearly 110 million years. We don't have a skeleton, Caleb Brown, a researcher at the Royal Tyrell Museum, told National Geographic. We have a dinosaur as it would have been. Another duck-billed dinosaur unearthed in 1999 contains unhealed bite marks on fossilized dinosaur skin, suggesting that the animal's carcass was scavenged 
before being covered in sediment. The finding challenges the traditional view that burial very soon after death is required for dinosaur mummies to naturally form. It is highly implausible that the preservation of vessels, cells, and complex molecules in dinosaurs is entirely consistent with the evolutionist perspective that dinosaurs died off millions of years ago. An interesting dinosaur question that scientists have a hard time answering is how did they get so big? Some dinosaurs did get very, very large, but this may not be the result of evolution. Regardless of adult size, all dinosaurs hatch from eggs, and there is a limit to how big an egg can be before the shell would be so thick that the baby couldn't break it to get out. The maximum size is about two feet in diameter. Myosaurus was as long as a school bus when grown, but only one foot long when coming out of its egg, and the long neck Camarasaurus grew from a three foot long hatchling to a behemoth with a length of 59 feet. To attain their huge bulk, dinosaurs must have experienced some impressive growth rates. Researchers estimated that to reach an adult weight of 57,094 pounds, a baby Apatosaurus would pack on more than 30 pounds per day. As an alternative to current scientific speculation, it is interesting to note that certain animals continue to grow as long as they live. The list of animals that grow until they die include amphibians, some fish, kangaroos, and what we would consider dinosaurs or lizards. Lolong, the world's largest crocodile, lived about 70 years and grew to 20 feet 3 inches long and weighed 2,370 pounds. Please note that Adam lived 930 years. What if animals as well as man had lived to be 930 or more years? How big would a crocodile get? Science puts dinosaurs over 60 million years before humans, but if the account in Genesis is true, Adam was contemporary with all living things. If dinosaurs lived at the same time as humans, why didn't they eat all the people? Initially, according to the scriptures, all bees, fowls, etc. were her herbivores. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. But by the flood the earth was filled with violence, and all flesh had corrupted itself, resulting in predators and prey. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 12 we read, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Two questions that many young Sunday school students ask are, were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? And, if so, how did they fit? Certainly, if dinosaurs lived in Noah's day, they got on the Ark, as the Bible says, every beast. The answer to how did they fit lies in two parts. One, it's likely that only young and thus relatively small dinosaurs entered the Ark. And two, the number of kinds of dinosaurs may be much fewer than one might expect. With regards to how many kinds of dinosaurs were possibly on the ark, it may be helpful to consider Can Canis familiaris, or the modern dog. Although dogs come in a great many varieties, sizes, and shapes, they are all classified as a single species because they can interbreed. That's a key identifier of a species. Can you tell by looking at the fossilized bones which dinosaurs can mate and produce viable offspring? Presently, some 700 named species of dinosaurs have been identified. However, many of these species are likely duplicates. Conservative estimates are that only 200 to 300 actual species existed. Some estimate that from among these, there may have only been as few as 60 kinds of dinosaurs. It simply wouldn't take very much room to contain 60 pairs of young dinosaurs. Science asserts five mass extinctions over the approximately 500 million years that life has supposedly existed on the earth and all before the time of Noah. There is, however, evidence consistent with the idea that while most of the plant and animal life on the earth perished in the flood, ultimately dinosaurs became extinct after the worldwide flood of Noah. They became extinct because plant extinction during and after the flood greatly reduced the available food supply the lifespan was decreased, predator behavior continued after the flood, and hunting by man. 
In addition to the evidence already presented, additional evidence to suggest that dinosaurs may have existed until modern times consists of pervasive legends, scriptural accounts, and numerous depictions in art. You might be surprised to learn that dinosaurs may have existed in historical times. For example, many cultures throughout the world, in Asia, Europe, North and South America and Africa, have legends about dragons. Dragons are supposedly mythical creatures, while at the same time, they are remarkably similar to modern reconstructions of dinosaurs created from their fossilized remains. If the creatures mentioned in these ancient legends are purely mythological, these globe-spanning similarities are hard to explain. The most detailed description of a probable dinosaur in the Bible appears in Job. The creature mentioned here, Behemoth, is a huge herbivorous four-footed beast with bones as strong as bronze and iron. The obvious clue that it, it is not a hippo or an elephant is the description of its tail, which he bends like a cedar tree. The cedars of the Middle East, such as the famous cedars of Lebanon, were very large trees. That's hardly an appropriate description for the tail of a hippo or an elephant. But it matches perfectly with several different species of seropod dinosaurs, such as the Apatosaurus. His great height is indicated by the phrase, the mountains lift up food to him. This implies that he stood taller than the trees, and he seems to have spent much of his time in the water. Under the lotus plants, he lies down in the shelter of the reeds in the marsh. His size and power do not match any living species. Will anyone capture him while he is on watch? Will he pierce his nose with snares? Just after this, Job mentions Leviathan, which closely matches some kind of pleosaur or other aquatic seagoing reptile of great mass and strength, but of limited mobility on land. That this is not an alligator is clear from the impossibility of killing him, even with many harpoons and other weapons. Dinosaur-like creatures are common in historical era artwork. The artifact here is a Mesopotamian jasper cylinder seal from about 3500 BC. This object is currently housed at the Louvre. The animal closely resembles an apatosaurus. The long neck, tail, legs, and feet on the artifact clearly fit the sauropods better than any other type of animal. The mosaic that was one of the wonders of the second century world is housed in Palestina, just south of Rome. This mosaic depicts Nile scenes from Egypt all the way up into Ethiopia. The top portion of this remarkable piece of art is generally believed to depict African animals being hunted by black-skinned warriors. These Ethiopians are pursuing what appears to be some type of dinosaur. The Greek letters above the reptilian animal in question are literally translated crocodile leopard. The picture shown here is only a small portion of the massive mosaic containing clear depictions of known animals, including Egyptian crocodiles and hippos. If the crocodile leopard is fictional in this mosaic, it is the only one. This picture was drawn by North American Anasazi Indians that lived in the area that has now become Utah between 150 BC and 1200 AD. Not only does it resemble a dinosaur, but the brownish film which has hardened over the picture along with the pitting and weathering attests to its age. That is, it isn't a recent fake. The petroglyph in this slide was discovered in 2012 by Jeremy Springfield on a trip to Hidden Mountain just outside of Las Lunas, New Mexico. The drawing is located on an isolated, inaccessible ledge near a very clear deer petroglyph. What were the ancient Pueblo peoples intending to depict, if not a living dinosaur-like creature that they knew from that region? Deep in the jungles of Cambodia are temples and palaces from the Khmer civilization. One such temple abounds with stone statues and relief art. Almost every square inch of the gray sandstone is covered with detailed carvings. These depict familiar animals like monkeys, deer, horses, elephants, water buffalo, parrots, and lizards. However, one column contains an intricate carving of a stegosaur-like creature. Note the upright posture, huge tail, and plates. But how could artisans decorating an 800-year-old Buddhist temple know what a dinosaur looked like when Western science only began assembling dinosaur skeletons in the past two centuries? It seems that the Khmer artist has seen or received reports of a stegosaur. The famous Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci penned this ink picture entitled Cats, Lions, and a Dragon. It was drawn in sometime between 1517 and 1518. 
It is now part of the Royal Collection House at Buckingham Palace. The cats are all drawn with the incredible realism and detail that comes from personal observation. The single dragon bears a remarkable likeness to a small sauropod dinosaur, but dinosaurs would not be discovered in Europe for another three centuries. What did Leonardo base his drawing upon? Some of the medieval French chateaux built at the close of the Middle Ages and early 1500s have dramatic dragon illustrations carved into their walls, ceilings, and furniture. The dragons are depicted with long necks, scales, prominent teeth, powerful claws, and an upright posture. Perhaps the most recent depiction of a dinosaur was created in 1496, when the Bishop of Carlisle, Richard Bell, was buried inside the cathedral in far northern England, near the Scottish border. The tomb is inlaid with brass, having various animals engraved upon it. Although worn by the countless feet that walked over it since the Middle Ages, one particular depiction is strikingly similar to two sauropod dinosaurs with their necks entangled. The long tails stick out straight like an apatosaurus, and one sport spikes on the end. Amongst the birds, dog, eel, bat, fox, etc. depicted around the tomb, this is the only unfamiliar animal and reinforces the theory that man and dinosaurs coexisted. I have only presented a sample of the accumulating evidence that questions some of the foundational scientific theories about life on Earth. This evidence suggests that the Earth may not be billions of years or even millions of years old as required by the theory of evolution. To the extent that evidence suggests a supreme creator is at work, it constitutes a crisis in modern science. Scientists have long wondered if intelligent life existed outside planet Earth. For this purpose, NASA created SETI, which is an acronym for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It is an effort to detect evidence of the technological civilizations that may exist somewhere in the universe, particularly in our galaxy. Using current technology, SETI seeks to detect radio or light signals that would reveal the presence of technically sophisticated beings. Please note that in order to hear a radio, one needs to first tune the radio into the correct frequency. For instance, one might tune one's radio to FM 100 in order to listen to the news or perhaps music. The question for the SETI group, then, is what frequency might extraterrestrials use? In 1959, physicists proposed using the line frequency of hydrogen in our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They reasoned that hydrogen is the simplest atom with just a single proton and single electron. What's more, hydrogen is by far the most abundant element in the universe. It is, therefore, a likely frequency that an alien species might use to send a radio communication to Earth. But hydrogen is so abundant that it can be hard to distinguish signals arising from natural versus artificial sources. For this reason, SETI uses the line frequency of hydrogen times pi, because pi is one of the most basic geometrical relationships, yet an irrational number such a frequency could not possibly be produced in a natural way and would clearly signal an artificial origin. Only an intelligent being would communicate with Earth using the line frequency of hydrogen multiplied by pi. 2009, and using the SETI communication concepts, David Cummings discovered that if you scale the SETI communication frequency, or line frequency of hydrogen times pi, by the speed of light, or c, the results miraculously equal the relative mass of the moon to the earth. His equation has been dubbed the equation of creation, and its implications are astounding. As it turns out, the ratio of masses between the moon and the earth is a really strange number. Specifically, the earth weighs 81 times that of the moon. So the moon to earth ratio is 1 divided by 81. The ratio contains all the digits of the base 10 number system except 8, or 0 0.01234567 repeated forever. Multiplying by the missing 8 yields 0 0.09876543211 rounded to the nearest tenth decimal place. David Cummings wondered how the relationship between the moon and the sun would yield such an unexpected and strange result, and realized that perhaps the Creator was sending us a message. Scientists immediately criticized David Cummings as having cherry-picked his units of measure in order to force his equation to balance. In this slide, one can see that Cummings' choice for his units of measure is irrelevant and the, with the exception of the distance that light travels in one second. 
Specifically, the line frequency of hydrogen is the number of cycles per second in the, in the numerator, and the speed of light is the distance it travels per second in the denominator. Recalling middle school math, anything divided by itself cancels out. Thus, as a unit of measure, seconds divided by seconds cancels, meaning it goes away. Likewise, in the moon to earth ratio example on the slide, kilograms is in both the numerator and denominator. And so kilograms as a unit of measure also cancels out. The speed of light can be measured in lots of ways. For instance, in miles per second, kilometers per second, feet per second, etc. It turns out that the unit of measure that makes the whole equation work is called a tom, after the person who discovered it, Alexander Tom, a professor of engineering at Oxford University in the United Kingdom. During a lifetime of research, Tom surveyed and measured over a thousand megalithic monuments. He discovered that a common unit of measurement seems to have been used over the vast area that he surveyed. The Tom is equal to 0 0.82941786 meters and has sometimes been referred to as a megalithic yard after the structures Tom measured. The choice of a megalithic yard per second to measure the speed of light has been highly criticized as being an approximation for the average stride of man rather than a measure of celestial importance. Okay, so I'm willing to concede the point because in this case, to me, it only makes things more sublime. Specifically, the idea that the length of the average human stride makes the whole equation work is in itself astounding. It directly links a most basic human function, that is walking to the most basic element, that is hydrogen, to a most basic geometric relationship, that is the ratio of the diameter of a circle to its circumference, and to one of the most basic attributes of the cosmos, that is light, and lastly, to the very orbs mankind depends on, the earth and its only moon. I cannot think of a more sublime result. There simply is nothing left to criticize. Cummings recognized the mathematical relationship as God's signature on his creations, in much the same way as an encrypted digital signature can be used in today's uh, computer world. That is, the equation of creation is God's signature on his creations. It transformed Cummings from atheist to a creationist. He said, I'm a scientist. As such, I didn't at first really believe it myself, but physics is physics, and maths is maths, and you can't argue with it. In our search for communication from extraterrestrial intelligence, surely we just found it, and the extraterrestrial turns out to be the creator himself. No scientific theory is without contradictory data. Anomalies and inconsistencies are part and parcel of the scientific method. As a result, science continually revises and refines its theories based on updated evidence. We expect that. So why should these particular data items constitute a crisis in science? The answer is because the data point to a supreme creator. The notion that a supreme being exists and operates throughout the cosmos for the benefit of man creates a monumental crisis for science at least as far as modern science is presently understood and practiced. On the other hand, those who look to the scriptures read that all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. The idea that science may experience such a crisis should not come as a surprise to people of faith. Paul wrote to Timothy, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is interesting that Paul would equate ever learning with peril. And in the scriptures we see also that the plan of the evil one is to confuse learning with wisdom, thus leading men to perish. Also the scriptures predict that in our day, all will go astray, except a few who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, even the followers of Christ do err in many instances because they are taught by the precepts of men. And what might the precepts of men be? And where are they taught? We are taught the precepts of men in school, beginning at a very young age. It is in school where society populates our memories and teaches us how to think. 
While much of what we learn in the school is important and useful, no academic subject is perfect and pure. It is therefore helpful to consider which academic subjects contain precepts that actually conflict with the scriptures and are thus most likely to cause people to err in the sight of God. For instance, <clears throat> geography, math, history, music, physical education, arts, and languages are unlikely candidates for causing people to depart from celestial principles. But as you saw in this presentation, certain branches of science are chock full of precepts that offend the great creator. Can you imagine how he feels after creating such a wondrous universe, the stars, the planets, the beautiful plants and animals, and finally man and women in his very own image and likeness? And what does man do? Men deny his hand in all these things and say that he had nothing to do with it. Everything just simply evolved. Men enforce their evolutionary view through the courts and legislation and ridicule anyone who even hints that science isn't the answer. It is, is it any wonder, God says, and in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. And he asks, For do ye suppose that ye can get rid of the justice of an offended God, who hath been trampled under feet of men? We should be very careful which precepts we embrace. I find it interesting that the scriptures relate worldly wisdom and learning with pride. Where today do we find the wise and the learned who are puffed up in pride? The answer is unambiguous. It is in the university. The universities are magnets for prideful people. I ought to know. I spent more than 30 years teaching at two major state universities. The ego within our universities is sometimes beyond description. There is no need to minimize the gulf between scripture and science, or to apologize for having faith, or to cut corners. The dichotomy is clear, and God will not be mocked. For example, was creation of anything by chance, or was creation of everything by divine design and all that that implies? Did man randomly evolve over billions of years, or was Adam and Eve placed on earth in the image and likeness of God about 6,000 years ago? Is Enoch, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, and the second coming, and for that matter, the whole Bible, a myth? Or was there really a global flood, and was the earth sub subsequently divided, etc., etc.? Can you see why our celestial creator would come out so forcefully against the precepts of men? The scriptures really leave very little room for evolution of species. If Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. What are all things which were created? Was it people, earth, rocks, mountains, rivers, oceans, plants, animals, the sun, the moon, comets, planets, stars, what does it mean to remain forever? What does it mean to have no end? Last of all, it is interesting to point out the following words of the Lord. For I, the Lord, have put forth my hand to exert the powers of heaven. Ye cannot see it now, yet in a little while, and ye shall see it. And know that I am, and that I will come and reign with my people. In this video, we have seen a glimpse of his power. And we look forward to the day when the Lord does return. At that day he will reveal all things, things above, things beneath, things upon the earth and in heaven, science notwithstanding, things which no man knew, not even the scientists, things which have passed, things most precious, a crisis of science and a triumph of faith. I didn't set out to prove that God exists and that science is all wrong, but I do hope that I gave people of faith a reason to hold on to their faith.